And I'm going to be talking about a topic this afternoon which is, uh, can be very emotive, can be very difficult, um, but it is part of the, the milieu in which we find ourselves today. And I think it is important that we do address it um, because sooner or later it's going to affect us. If it may not affect us now, but certainly our children are being marinated in these kind of uh, thinkings, these kind of ideologies that are around us these days. And so it's important that we understand um, the, the basics of what is being discussed and how do we respond to it from a biblical basis. Uh, because we are called to represent Jesus Christ, who loves all people, who died that all people might be saved, and who did not come to divide this world, but in order that all might be saved. And so uh, I'm going to be talking this afternoon in our last talk. It's called Wrong Think 3. Um, this is definitely not in harmony with the new think that is driving our world today. Uh, but in Wrong Think 3, I'm going to be discussing the issue of critical race theory. You've probably heard the phrase critical race theory bandied about. I'm going to be discussing today um, what are the basic tenets of a critical race theory, the basic beliefs, um, what are some of the criticisms of critical race theory, and uh, some of the biblical framework. How do we respond to this issue such as critical race theory? It's important as well that as, as we talk about these things, that we're speaking here from the perspective of the kingdom of God, not from any partisan political perspective here today. Um, when we talk about losing social media, um, this affects everybody. Just because it affects one side more than the other doesn't deny the reality that one day everybody may be affected by this. Uh, we do not uh, support any kind of law-breaking as Christians. We are called to honor the laws of the land in which we live insofar as they uphold and honor the law of God. We are to call to obey God rather than man, but we're also called to be the best possible citizens. And so it is important for us to recognize that, for instance, violence in our streets over the last year we utterly abhor, including the violence at the state capitol just this last week. We do not stand by or applaud or secretly wink-wink at people who seek to invade the, the, the Capitol building, those who seek to burn buildings to the ground. We want this to be a nation of law-abiding of law citizens where all people have a ch an opportunity to flourish, all people have equality before the law and equal opportunity, and all people have the chance to live out their dreams. And so we're speaking uh, during this Religious Liberty Sabbath from the perspective of the Kingdom of God and not from any partisan political perspective and I hope that it's not interpreted in any other way. So let's bow our heads and ask for God's blessing upon us as we touch upon this difficult topic. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you that you created the human race in your image, that the, uh, the Asian and the African and the European and the American and the, the, the Eskimo and uh, every part of the wonderful, incredible diversity of the human family is every part of that is created in your image. The Father, I thank you that we can learn from each other more about you. I thank you, Father, that as we walk with each other and share with each other and learn from each other and pray with each other and serve one another, that we can magnify the image of God in our own lives. Lord, as I pray, I pray, Lord, that as I share these thoughts today, I pray that your spirit will lead me and guide me, that you'll watch over every word that comes from my tongue. I pray, Father, for those who are listening, that they will hear not me, but the spirit speaking to their hearts. Father, we thank you for those watching at home, online. We pray your blessing upon them, wherever they are scattered around the world. And I ask, Lord, that as a result of this Religious Liberty Sabbath, our witness for you will burn brighter, our love for you will be truer, our faith will be deeper, and our walk will be stronger. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. All right, so if I were to ask you what is the most important thing in your life, what would it be? Um, good question. Uh, some people will say, maybe it's my boat, maybe it's my car, and um, I see Brooks raising his hand back there, I'm not sure what's for you. All right, so, yeah, so the most important thing for many people is their children, and we do anything for our children. Our children are a gift from God, and we are stewards of that gift from God, prayerfully leading our children into the kingdom of God, and as such, their education is very important to us. How our children are educated, what they hear in their education, the ideologies that surround their education are very, very important. And make no mistake, education has an underlying ideology. Education is never within a vacuum. Dr. Andrea Luxon, the president of Andrews, correctly stated it. She said, I think Adventist education is more important than ever. Why? Because education is never in a vacuum. There's always underlying ideologies that drive what happens in a school or university. 
And I would agree with every word that Dr. Luxton says there. There is always an underlying ideology driving what happens uh, behind the education of our children. And if we're concerned about our children's eternal salvation, we need to be concerned about the ideologies that impact their education. And so, as, I, as we go through today, I want to suggest that just because you are called an Adventist school does not mean you are providing an Adventist education per se. You must examine critically the underlying ideology to see where is this ideology coming from and what is it saying. So as we talk about critical race theory, we'll start out by saying, well, what exactly is critical race theory? It's always good to get some definitions so we know what we're talking about. Critical race theory was developed by um, the first tenured African-American law professor at Harvard. His name was Professor Derek Bell, Jr. Uh, he, was rega he is regarded as the originator of critical race theory. And his ideas have evolved over the last 30 years and now propagated by very well-known individuals in the American literary scene. You've probably heard of a writer called Robin DiAngelo, who wrote a very famous book just recently called White Fragility, Why It's So Hard for White People to Talk About Racism. And if you haven't heard of Robin DiAngelo, now you have. Then you have the revisionist history of the New York Times' 1619 Project, which argues that America began not with the revolution, but with the first African slave coming to America, and that Africa was essentially designed to perpetuate and propagate the enslavement of African peoples. Then you have um, the, um, Abraham X, Ibram X. Kendi, who wrote a very, very famous book. He's a professor in Boston called How to Be an Anti-Racist. And that phrase, anti-racist, in the year 2020 took on a whole new meaning. We'll discuss that uh, shortly. Then you have Ta-Nehisi Ta Coates, who wrote a book called Between the World and Me, and Delgado and Stefanic, who wrote a book called Critical Race Theory and Introduction. These are very, very popular books today. Uh, D'Angelo's book, um, White Fragility, um, passes through many Adventist hands. I've seen it. I've seen it on people's shelves. People recommend it to me. Um, it's been on the New York Times bestsellers list for months now. It's a very, very common book that's kind of permeating through the American consciousness and the American thinking uh, population. So according to Britannica, so there you are, those are some of the key critical race theory writers there. According to uh, Britannica, um, an online definition or dictionary, this is definition of critical race theory. Now, there are different definitions, but I think this is about as workable a definition as we could look for it. Critical race theory is the view that the law and legal institutions are inherently racist, and that race itself, instead of being biologically grounded and natural, is actually a socially constructed concept that is used by white people to further their economic and political interests at the expense of people of color. That is, critical race theory argues that, um, that race is actually a social construct rather than grounded in any other reality. According to critical race theory, racial inequality emerges from the social, economic, and illegal differences that white people create between races, races to maintain elite white interests in labor markets and politics, giving rise to poverty and criminality in many minority communities. This, then, is a, a functional definition of critical race theory uh, that we're going to be basing today's discussion on. Now, critical to understanding critical race theory is understanding the difference between equity and equality. Equity in critical race theory is the idea that society produces policies that produce equal outcomes for all ethnic groups, such as everybody lives the same period of time, everybody has the same standard of income, etc., etc. And that is opposed and in rejection of the liberal principle of equality, such as equality before the law, equality of process, equality of opportunity, and, and so forth. And so, whereas the, the liberals of the 1700s, 1800s, and 1900s would push for equality, um, that is now rejected as being intrinsically racist. So some of the key tenets of critical race theory are as follows. Firstly, uh, critical race theory argues for the permanence of systemic racism, that racism is entrenched in every social structure within the United States. Racism in critical race theory is a relentless fact of life, so entrenched and enmeshed in society that it appears ordinary to people within that culture. Secondly, um, whiteness is property. Whiteness is something that you possess. All whites, according to critical race dial, um, theorists, are complicit in racist, racism because they possess whiteness as a political caste and they benefit from the systemic racism that maintains their socioeconomic dominance. And so whiteness is property. It's not just the color of your skin, it's like a, like a caste that you have. 
Uh, Oprah Winfrey has given extensive discussions on whiteness as property. Then counter storytelling. <clears throat> this is an important part of critical race theory. What does it mean? Well, critical race theory challenges the experience of white European Americans as being the normative standard for society, such as punctuality, being on time to work, and supporting one's nuclear family are now viewed as being ideas of white supremacy, and they are to be rejected in favor of other ways of living. Critical race theory promotes storytelling by oppressed minorities to challenge the dominant white supremacy and the social construction of race. The fourth major tenet of critical race theory is a rejection of the Enlightenment. According to Delgado, a very famous critical race writer, critical race theory, quote, questions the very foundations of the liberal order, including equality theory, legal reasoning, Enlightenment rationalism, and neutral principles of constitutional law, end quote. Critical race theory thus rejects standardized testing in schools, it rejects the concept of meritocracy, it rejects colorblindness, it rejects equality before the law, it rejects the idea that the government strives to give everybody equal opportunity, it rejects the concept of legal reasoning or science or rationality or mathematics or science, it rejects the neutrality of constitutional law, all of which in critical race theory allegedly maintain this phenomenon known as white supremacy. Now, perhaps uh, most, most interestingly in this is the concept of interest convergence. And uh, this is something that is particularly applicable to, uh, to white folks who consider them more on the liberal side of the spectrum, but this, all of this affects all of us one way or another. Derek Bell came up with what he called the interest convergence hypothesis. Now, the interest co convergence hypothesis argues that advances for black people only happen when such advances are in the interests of white people. Did you hear what I say there? That means that the massive progress in race relations since the civil rights movement is therefore a myth. He argued that white people who champion the interests of black people are not doing so because they are virtuous or good. White people who champion the interests of black people are only doing so because it perpetuates their own white supremacy. And therefore, no actions by white people to promote the interests or well-being of black communities can ever be trusted for every white person is intrinsically and forever a racist. This is a very gloomy hypothesis, the interest convergence hypothesis. When you first allege that all white people are guilty of all oppression in human history, and then you say that any time a white person seeks to help someone in a marginalized community, they're only doing so to enhance their own dominance in society, uh, then you might as well have a genocide of white people because they're intrinsically only evil. They never can be doing, can be doing anything good. Critical race theory promotes historical revisionism, such as the New York Times 1619 project, the concept that America began with the arrival of the first African slaves, and America's original purpose was to maintain and exploit black slavery. The USA is thus, in critical race theory, irredeemably stained, systemically racist, by the original sin of slavery and racism, and to, perpetu and to perpetuate the United States is to perpetuate systemic racism per se. Therefore, the United States must be torn down. The United States must be torn down. When you hear Antifa chanting, and this is one of their chants, no borders, no walls, no USA at all, you know exactly where this is going. It's the dissolution of our country. Critical race theory also promotes the concept of intersectionality. The very famous black feminist scholar, Kimberly Crenshaw, is best known for the concept of intersectionality. And so in, in her writings, I've just lost my place here, race, gender, sexuality, and other identity markers are understood as cultural constructs rather than absolute realities, yet oppression is experienced along all of those dimensions. That is, it, there's an intersectional oppression going on. And in response, in the writings of Crenshaw, race is to be the dominant factor in all decisions across society. Critical race theory furthermore rejects the biblical principle of equality before the law. The Word of God says this in Leviticus 19:15, you shall do no injustice in judgment, you shall not be partial to the poor nor defer to the great, but you are to judge your neighbor fairly. God seeks for justice that does not really look at how rich or poor you are or, or what background you have. That is the biblical ideal of justice. And this foundational principle in the Word of God is based on the truth that everybody is created in the image of God and therefore all have an equal intrinsic and moral value before God. And the state, in its disposition of justice, must recognize that intrinsic equality, that intrinsic human dignity before God, 
And so the Bible can explicitly condemns partial treatment of one group over another, such as the rich over the poor in the legal judicial system. Critical race theories focus on equity, that is equal outcomes for everybody, regardless of input, energy, hard work, talent, education, appetite for risk, or family culture. It, reje it rejects the biblical principles of equality of opportunity and personal responsibility. If someone does not work, neither shall he eat. Read 2 Thessalonians 3.10. Galatians 6, seven. do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For as a man soweth, so shall he reap. Critical race theory also rejects the very concept of truth. Truth in critical race theory, capital T, truth, is now considered to be a Euro-white construct that is to be rejected as intrinsically racist. There is no objective truth in critical race theory. To say that there is truth is now a racist statement. There is your truth, and there is my truth, but there's no longer the truth. The truth, by definition, is a racist concept within critical race theory. Critical race theory represents a rejection of the biblical nuclear family, best exemplified in what Black Lives Matter published in their website, where they called for the dissolution of the nuclear family and children to be raised by a community. Uh, part of this is, of, is, um, is critical theory that you're looking at power dynamics. And in critical theory, a parent raising a child is an unequal power balance because a parent has more power than a child, and therefore we need to eliminate the parent's power over the child. It's called parentism. It's something that must be eliminated. And so this is one of the calls that uh, Black Lives Matter made on their website for the destruction of the nuclear family. And so we have within critical race theory, um, we have some, uh, these are some of the basic tenets of critical race theory. I want to address now some, some challenges to critical race theory. Uh, firstly, is the concept that ra racism is present in every aspect of life, in every relationship, and in every interaction. And I have no doubt, and I know this is true, but racism is alive and present in the United States. And for us to deny it is simply wrong. Racism is present. And if you don't believe that, spend some time with somebody of a different color to you and hear their experiences. Racism is present in America and it is to be condemned out of hand, period. There is no justification for it. But we must ask ourselves what we define as racism because the goalposts keep shifting by the year almost. We're gonna to come to those shifting goalposts um, shortly, shortly um, hereafter. Critical race theory teaches that because the USA has unequal outcomes across racial groups, that means the country must be, by definition, systemically racist. No other explanation is even possible. No other explanation is allowed. To offer any explanation other than systemic racism for unequal outcomes in society is, by definition, racist. Woke individuals therefore look relentlessly for the racism that must be present in every organization, in every institution, and in every relationship, and looking for it wherever they can, leading inevitably to bitter division and infighting. Because tolerating racism is racist, and I would agree with that, you must call out, reject, and cancel whoever is guilty of alleged racism, even if that individual is your family member. The principle of interest convergence, as spoken by um, Professor Bell, it's a destructive construct. If anyone with what is called racial privilege, such as white or Asian or Hispanic or Indian or Arabic or any other lighter-skinned black person, um, if they become an, an anti-racist activist, then the interest convergence hypothesis states that they only do so to maintain their own racial privilege, to flaunt their social virtue and to avoid dealing with their own racism. So the interest convergence hypothesis makes it literally impossible for anyone with racial privilege to ever do the right thing. Are you following me on this? And it's interesting how we demonize certain races, the tragic events of Trevon Martin and, and Zimmerman. Um, I'd never heard of this before, but during when CNN were talking about this, they kept referring to Zimmerman, Zimmerman as being a white Hispanic. Does anybody remember that? I thought, what is a white Hispanic? I'd never heard of a white Hispanic before, but it is part of the demonization of whiteness that we call Zimmerman a white Hispanic when he really was a gentleman of Hispanic heritage. We then find that critical race theory rejects open and free societies. Societies that value individual liberty, freedom of conscience, freedom of expression, freedom of speech, freedom of association, freedom to gather, freedom of movement and freedom of religion are allegedly organized to maintain white racist supremacy or hegemony over marginalized groups and they perpetuate inequities across racial groups. 
And so that is why critical race theory really is dedicated to the destruction of the rights that we enjoy as American citizens of all backgrounds, such as the freedom of speech and freedom of association and freedom of conscience. Critical race theory also rejects the individual because it is Marxist ideology. And in Marxist ideology, what matters is not the individual, but the group. And in Marxist ideology, in every time and generation, certain groups are to be promoted and certain groups are to be destroyed. And if you look through the last 120 years, you will realize that in different times and different societies, Marxist ideology said this group is bad and this group is good. Uh, so for instance, in the killing fields of Cambodia, if you were a teacher, you were to be executed because you, you, you could think for yourself and the Khmer Rouge didn't want people who could think for themselves. In the Soviet Union, if you were a smallholder farmer, uh, as uh, Professor Markovich was saying, uh, in, in the collectivization process in the 30s in the Ukraine, the Soviet, the Stalin decided he didn't want small farmers they were called kulaks, and so he started on a process of what he called de-kulakization, which is we're gonna wipe out the kulaks. Millions perished, either slaughtered in the Ukraine, starved to death, or deported to Central Asia. And critical race theory has the same attitude because it's a Marxist ideology that we do not treat you as an individual on your own merits, but we treat you based on the group into which you are a part. And that group can change by the minute if you believe in sexual orientation fluidity and gender fluidity and all the rest of it being fluid as well. And so critical race theory rejects the group in favor of the rights of the individual. And so um, this is interesting because on Monday we celebrate Martin Luther King Day, do we not? And yet why do we celebrate Martin Luther King? Because Martin Luther King is antithetically opposed to everything that critical race theory teaches. Perhaps his most famous teaching was that he longed for a day when in America a person will be judged by the content of their character rather than the color of their skin. We've all heard that very famous st statement, yes? And I hope we can all agree by it, by God's grace. We all agree that we can judge people by the content of their character rather than the color of their skin. But that idea that your skin color does not matter and you're judged by the content of your character is antithetically opposed to critical race theory, which says the only thing that matters is the color of your skin. And what you say or do is immaterial as an individual. So we celebrate Martin Luther King Day, even though he represents uh, an understanding of racial issues profoundly opposed to critical race theory. Critical race theorists would never accept Martin Luther King today if we were on the scene. He would be condemned as being a white supremacist. Critical race theory also rejects science and mathematics. Why? Because these are allegedly white ways of knowing. It prefers storytelling and the subjective lived experience as being black ways of knowing. And there actually is a place for both, for storytelling and research, but critical race theory rejects scientific research, it rejects the scientific method, it, it rejects logic, it rejects reason, it rejects dialogue, it rejects um, pretty much everything that all of us around the world actually are familiar with in terms of under growing understanding in favor of personal storytelling. The principle of universality says it doesn't matter who does an experiment or where it takes place, the result will always be the same. But critical race theory rejects these principles, such as the principle of universality and objectivity, as being oppressive myths, since science and math encode and perpetuate systemic racism, they are to be rejected. And the irony is we have universities all across America who preach critical race theory and they keep their math departments open, and they keep their engineering departments open, and they keep their chemistry departments open, and they keep their philosophy departments open, because they should all be closed down as being expressions of white supremacy. Critical race theory declares that any who disagree are racists. It rejects all alternatives, such as colorblindness, as being racist. The liberal ideals of an open society, Martin Luther King's ideal that we all celebrate on Monday of judging a person by the content of their character rather than by the color of his or her skin, of working for full equality before the law, and of seeking to give everybody equality of opportunity, are now rejected as they allegedly ignore the systemic racism that requires the entire system to be destroyed. Critical race theory declares that any who disagree with it are driven by racism. You cannot have an honest disagreement. Critical race theory predetermines the lived experience of every racial group. You are either oppressed or oppressor, and it requires every member of every racial group to affirm those ideological perspectives. And when an African-American man such as Kanye West to have the courage to leave the reservation and reject critical race theory ideology, he was publicly condemned and vilified across popular media in America as being crazy or a race traitor or just sheer out bad. 
If you're not following Kanye West, then you know, at least look him up and understand what happened to him. He is uh, treated as a pariah because he decided to think for himself. So to become black in America now is a political identity, first and foremost, rather than an ethnic identity. And diversity is only skin deep, for everybody's worldview must be identical in order to be acceptable to critical race theory. And critical race theory is totalitarian, and it seeks absolute power. Now, James Lindsay, a very famous writer in this area, he argues that critical race theory cannot be disagreed with, especially by black people themselves, because it rejects all, and all alternatives, and it denies all racial progress as a mirage due to the interest convergence hypothesis. Because critical race theory rejects science, it cannot be falsified or proven wrong by evidence to the contrary. And because it assumes racism is present in every situation, even the acceptance of critical race theory must somehow also be racist. Therefore, critical race theory is an insatiable beast that can never be satisfied and will tear apart anything that it comes into contact with, your marriage, your home, your church, your institution, your business, your employer, and your nation. And what we're seeing on the streets of America over the last couple of years is the, is the fruit of, this, of our young people across America being marinated in this ideology uh, for the last 10, 15 years. Does this affect Adventism? Uh, yes, it does. And uh, I'm not gonna go through all the stuff that I was planning to talk about. Our time is moving on here. But I will say this. Um, before you send your children to an Adventist institution, think very carefully and examine their public statements and their, 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 um, what they're teaching. If you go to an Adventist school that commits to being a safe space, as we saw earlier today, a safe space is, is, is code for an inclusive environment. And in inclusion, as we saw in, in Wrong Think 2, our sermon of earlier today, it means that nothing can be allowed to question a student's self-identity or journey in life. If a student goes to college and thinks that he is, he is she or she is he, and uh, he thinks he wants to engage in sexual activity outside of revealed biblical morality, that must now be affirmed within that college. Nothing can be allowed to deny it or question it or even suggest that there's something wrong with it. And the call to repentance must certainly be closed down because that is hate speech. It's a microaggression because it says that something in your life is not quite right. So I'm not gonna go into any further detail on that other than to say that uh, if your institution or your business declares itself a safe space, Please understand the ideological implications of this. This is the adoption of Marxist ideology at your facility. It's the adoption of Marxist teachings to, to marinate the young people in. If your university, if your business, if your employer, and this affects many of us in America today, if your business now um, talks about unconscious bias and the implicit association test from Harvard, uh, which came out some years ago, you need to be very careful about this because in the implicit association test, this seeks to identify which members you believe to be on an in-group and who you believe to be on the out-group. Now, three academics at Harvard developed the implicit association test, and two of them have now come out and said they actually disagree with its accuracy. It doesn't do what it purports to do. Unconscious bias training is rooted in the critical race theory dogma of intersectionality, and it is the concept that the West and much of the world is a deadly matrix of oppression for all except heterosexual white males. And that matrix of oppression is forever shifting, depending on how your personal identity shifts, how your gender shifts, how it's fluid, how your sexual orientation shifts by the day or month, um, your trans ideology. And this leads, nothing, leads to nothing but bitter division as different groups vie for the most oppressed group status. You may also have uh, an employer, or you may work for an institution, or your business that may declare itself to be an anti-racist institution. And before 2020, we would say amen and amen to that, because we all explicitly and intentionally and, uh, disavow racism in its many forms. We'll come onto that in a few minutes. But after 2020, the phrase anti-racist, after the writings of Ibram X. Kendi, one of the best sellers of 2020, now it has a technical meaning, and we must understand anti-racist within the context of Ibram X. Kendi's writings, a very, very famous writer within America, to, within America today. Racism is being continually redefined and broadened to meet the increasing demands for social justice. It used to be when I was growing up that racism was understood to be prejudice of one ethnic group against another. 
That's what I thought racism to be, and that's what we were taught from the scriptures is fundamentally wrong and antithetical to the kingdom of God, that you cannot display prejudice or hostility from one ethnic group to another. You cannot say that one ethnic group is somehow better than another ethnic group. But the world has moved on. Then it became that racism is power plus prejudice, that you don't, only, you don't just have prejudice, but now you have institutional power. And because whites hold the institutional power in America, that means only whites can be racist and everybody else can never be racist. They can be prejudiced, but they can never be racist no matter what they do or say because they don't hold institutional power. That was the definition even in 2019 of racism, that racism is institutional power plus prejudice that equals racism. But the world has moved on since then, and I hope you're keeping up with these ever-changing definitions. The latest definition, as it comes from Ibram X. Kendi's book, um, How to Be an Anti-Racist, well, he further expands the definition of racism. And for Kendi, anti-racism means supporting and instituting policies that equalize all racial disparities across all ethnic groups, while racism consists of any policy or idea that results in racial inequity. You are either racist or anti-racist. Merely not being racist means that you are still a racist. You are, not, you are only not a racist if you become an anti-racist activist pushing for a Marxist super, super state that will eliminate all policies that may inevitably or un unintentionally create unequal outcomes. To argue that disparities may have other contributing factors within society other than being the exclusive results of systemic white racism is now a racist position in and of itself. You cannot question this. Kendi ignores the fact in America today that there has never been any society that has ever accomplished equal outcomes among all groups. It has never been accomplished on any continent at any point in human history. In fact, the only real equality that was ever achieved in any society was in the concentration camps of Germany or the Soviet Union, where everybody could die equally well together. The fact that in the United States there are many ethnic groups with very significantly better socioeconomic outcomes than the white community such as the Indian Americans, the Filipino Americans, the Taiwanese Americans, the Nigerian Americans, the Japanese Americans, the Chinese Americans, Pakistani Americans, and the list goes on and on. The fact that there are many groups who have significantly higher socio socioeconomic outcomes than the white community, that cannot be allowed to be part of this conversation. Yet Kendi still interprets the world through a rigid white racism, black victimization binary that bears little relation to the complexities of America today as a multicultural, multi-ethnic, and multi-faith society. It seems to me that any culture or any subculture in the United States that promotes education, that values hard work, that promotes the concept of savings, that respects women and the nuclear family, and promotes the delaying of gratification for future reward, those groups within society will tend to go further than any group in society that does not hold those values. Yet as long as racial differentials exist, critical race theory systematically blames systemic racism for everything and justifies every and every measure necessary to eliminate such differentials. Anyone who questions this approach is being deplatformed and socially destroyed by being um, labeled as a racist and being canceled. And then you have the reading lists. If you look at um, the reading lists, what's being promoted in the schools, you can do this. Go and look at on the schools what their reading lists are. Look at what um, a public school or Adventist school, it matters not. Look at the books that are being promoted. Take a hard look at those reading lists because that's the ideology that will fill your children's minds. And you'll send your children to school as with a Christian or biblical worldview, and they'll come back and you kind of wonder what happens to your child. Part of it is because our children are being marinated in, in critical race theory and Marxist ideology. And it's incumbent upon us as parents to think very carefully about where we want our children to go and where we counsel them to go for their education. Look at the reading lists. That is a good indication of where that school is going. So what do we say in response to the challenge of racism as Christians? It's very important that we don't just condemn or crit critique, but we actually affirm something that is positive. The good news of salvation is clear that we're all created in the image of God. Every man, woman, and child on planet Earth. That each one of us has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. And God has made, and I quote, from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, Acts 17.26. We are all descended from one original family, Adam and Eve. 
And God sent his son into the world that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but whosoever believes in him will have eternal life, regardless of your race. We are all represented at Calvary by the three representatives of Noah's family. At the foot of the cross was Simon of Cyrene, representing Ham, or the, the African side of the human family. The Roman centurion represented Japheth, and the thief on the cross represented Shem, or the Semitic group of the, of the human family. Shem, Ham, and Japheth were united at Calvary, all in equal need of salvation, and all received salvation from Jesus Christ. And so no group has any prior claim to salvation. No ethnic group has prior ac priority access to God. And God longs to meet with the saved of the earth, drawn from every nation, tribe, language, and people on the day when all things are made new again. And so we may conclude that to espouse or uphold racist beliefs defined as the understanding that one group is somehow inferior to another, is a totally, uh, it, is a, it is a denial of the gospel and an affront to our creator. Racism cannot be legislated out of existence despite the best uh, uh, intentions of social um, cancel culture and so forth. It cannot be suppressed through social media campaigns. It is a sin. It resides within the human heart. It may be driven out of polite public discourse, but that cannot change the human heart. And so as Christians, we are called as individuals and as a wider society to look in the mirror and to cry out with David, have mercy upon me, O God, according to your steadfast love and according to your, ever, your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions, including the transgression of racism, and wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Purge me with hyssop, hyssop and I shall be clean. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Search me, O God, and see if there be any, test me, know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. As Christians, we are called to ask ourselves, how do we treat our brothers and our sisters? Do we treat our brothers and our sisters at God, as God would have us treat them? Do we think of our brothers and sisters' thoughts that would bring honor and glory to our Heavenly Father? Do we work for the well-being of all aspects and all, all parts of our wider community? Or are we happy to turn a blind eye when some fall behind? That is not a Christian response. We are called to work for the well-being of all parts of our community. That doesn't mean you're a critical race theorist. It means you're a Christian and you have a conscience and you recognize that all people are created in God's image. So my final thoughts are these. For parents, carefully reflect where you send your children. If those institutions are promoting critical race theory, send them somewhere else. It's not popular, but send them somewhere else. For local members here in this church, here in Village and around the world, for those of you watching online, Pray that God will work upon the hearts of the leaders of our colleges and our schools all across the world, that they will not drink of the false gospel of critical race theory, but they will point our children to the true gospel of Jesus Christ. And for the board members of our institutional educations, you're not called to be a board member so that you can fill time in your calendar. You have a sacred responsibility to ensure that the ship does not steer off course. Take your board responsibilities seriously. Ask questions and insist that if an educational institution is called Adventist, then it adheres to scripture rather than to atheist ideology. And in all that we do, let the truth be spoken in love, for we are all sinners in need of God's grace. I want to conclude there today. This is a critical race theory is a, is a difficult issue. I've just kind of given it a very brief summary here. Um, I think that as Christians, we must be aware, we must listen to the cries of the community around us, we must respond in love, and we must work for the betterment of every aspect of our community. And we must do that in a way that honors God and God's image within our community, rather than um, promotes atheist, atheist critical race theory, because that's not, not gonna lead to anything good. It'll just lead to further human degradation and suffering. So we come to the end today of our Religious Liberty Sabbath. It's 4.56, we were gonna finish by five, and we are almost there. I'd like to say thank you to all of you who've been with us today. It's been a privilege sharing with you. Um, thank you for coming out and supporting. For those of you watching at home, we want to say thank you as well for all you have uh, meant to us. Uh, we know we have a lot of comments coming in on social media. I'll probably take a week, then I'll take a look at those. But um, we want to thank you for watching online as well. I'd like to say thank you this afternoon to, um, to our speakers, to Dr. John Markovich. Thank you, sir, for preparing your presentation on the Chinese Cultural Revolution and its implications for Christians. We'd like to thank Pastor Michael Koshawama and 
um, Troy Homanchuk and Ron Knott for your presentation on social media. Thank you for taking the time to prepare for that. We'd like to thank our Village Religious Liberty Committee that's taken the time to think through these issues and to, we've reviewed this and reviewed it back and forth and what are we gonna talk about? Uh, we meet quite regularly, we think what's going on in our world and I'd like to thank the members of the Religious Liberty Committee for helping to put together our annual Religious Liberty Sabbath every, every year. And beyond this though, this isn't just an event in the annual calendar of the Village Church or the North American Division. This is something that we all live with day by day. If you don't use your rights, you will lose your rights. So use your rights. Share the gospel while you may. Show God's love to somebody this week. Help somebody who is hurting. Encourage someone who is depressed. Give, some of, give someone a phone call who's feeling isolated. Use your religious liberty and demonstrate the love of God in this coming week. We don't just talk about this on a defensive posture at one Sabbath a year. I want to encourage you to live the life of Jesus, be the salt of the earth and the light of the world in this coming week, that all men may know that beyond this troubled world, there is a savior and that he's coming again. Let's bow our heads and we'll close with prayer. So dear Father, we, we thank you today for the protection of your angels. We thank you, Father, for the freedom we yet enjoy here in America, for what has, uh, for this incredible gift you've given us, freedom of conscience. And Father, I pray that this liberty you've given us, we will not use it to tear each other apart, but we will use it for serving one another in love, as the Apostle Paul wrote. I thank you, Father, um, for those who've been watching online and have come to church here today. As we enter this coming week, Father, I pray that you give each one of us someone, or a family, or a neighbor, or a community that is in need of help. And Father, may we respond with love in our hearts, recognizing that this is a God-given opportunity for the love of God to flow through us to those around us. And Lord, as we minister to others, may we not be so proud that we are not open to being ministered unto ourselves. So Father, give us humble hearts, give us a sense of self-awareness, and in all we do, may the love of Jesus motivate us day by day. Thank you for hearing this prayer. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen.